it anything to do with a certain religion, do you think? No, is there anything is it? like that? No, it's no, more to do no. with a kind of a drug, isn't it? It's a drug. Yeah, well, those that take it want to be, ought to be ashamed well. of themselves. According to The Sun, there were thousands of empty ecstasy wrappers littering the floor of the 250-foot-long hangar. Drugs, sex, sensation. Some newspapers have called acid house music a sinister and evil cult which lures young people into drug-taking. The message is certainly getting across. The organisers kept the location secret until the very last moment, which was the main reason, according to the papers, why there were so few police here and they were unable to act. Drug-crazed kids, some as young as 12, boogied for eight hours yesterday at Britain's biggest ever ecstasy bash. The party took place here, infiltrated by reporters from the Mail and the Sun. There's, there's meant to be a drugs-related craze. What do you know about acid house music? It must affect the brain in some way. Unless it's just the music that does it. it. Oh, All no. them lights flashing don't do you any good either, do it? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't even go in the uh, pub where them lights are. Oh, no, they drive no. you mate, Welcome to the 88 Podcast with yours truly, Wayne Anthony. And tonight's episode, episode 13, lucky for some, unlucky for others. In my case, it's actually a really lucky number. So I decided that we would dedicate this episode to reminiscing our memories about Leaside Road in Hackney, where Genesis held four or five parties in 1988 so welcome to the show now before we go on let me give the network a quick plug i don't like doing it but it is an essential part of supporting the network and helping this podcast to grow it's a young podcast so we do actually need the support from the viewers and the listeners it's a video and audio podcast so we do have a channel on youtube so come along and subscribe and press that notification button so you can actually get notifications of when the videos are released you all know the the drill by now but on the channel we have all the episodes as you can see we have interviewed a bunch of delightful people Here you go. And our last episode was the Media Hype Part 3. We also do lots of little uh, clips that we do on the YouTube channel exclusively for the YouTube channel. On social media, we have an Instagram page. We're on Facebook as well. Hit us up and twitter hit us up and the official web page is the 88podcast.com and on this page well on this website we have all of the links to all the different podcasts also links for all the videos we have all the different links to where you can find the podcast on all the different podcast networks such as apple spotify Google Podcasts, Mixcloud, Stitcher, Red Circle, Podcast Addict, CastBox, Radio Public, Podcast Republic. You can download the podcast from all those networks and lots of others. We also have a lot of the show notes on each of the different podcasts that we produce. At the moment, I'm just showing everyone the show notes from podcast 12 episode 12 as soon as they come in the internet's a bit slow today there we go and so you get all the podcasts and then you would get all the different links and all the different video links associated with that so that's done and one more little plug and that would be my book class of 88 originally it was published by Virgin in 19th of February 1998 and it was originally called Class of 88 The True Acid House Experience 
and the book was reissued by Virgin again on the 22nd of March 2018. So you can get that on Amazon and at all good bookshops. So that's the plug-in out of the way. You can see on the background, there's a young picture or a picture of a young me. And that is actually in Leaside Road Warehouse. But we'll talk about that a bit later. For now, let's have a look at some of the flyers. Now, as I said, this is, we're reminiscing about 32 years ago, around this time. It's today, when recording this podcast, it's the 19th of December 2020 and I wanted to speak a little bit about some of the flyers for some of the events that we had at Leaside Road and so we had it's sometimes it gets it gets a bit murky but we had a, a four or five events there because we did one as you can see from the screen we did one Genesis chapter 2 the struggle continues Saturday Eve the 24th of December Please park sensibly, and in brackets, we've got thank you. And on this flyer, we actually didn't put the warehouse address on. We actually put the um, a meeting point, which was Lee Valley Ice Rink, which is on Leebridge Road. It's quite a central location. At this point, we didn't really need to create strategic meeting points because it was so new that the police wasn't really acid house parties wasn't actually really on their radar even though if you watch our podcasts um related to the media media hype part one part two and part three in part one it's dedicated to all the news articles that came out in 1988 and if you read those articles a lot had actually been said about acid house and, and as i mentioned on another podcast the acid house could have really died a death at that point. But the newspapers made such a big thing out of it. And, you know, the national newspapers that it brought it back to life. It brought it back onto the radar of lots of people that hadn't even heard of acid house. And so suddenly there were thousands and thousands of people around the, the country that wanted to discover one of these secret acid house parties. And we were around at the right place at the right time and we'd never ever done parties before at all in fact i'd never done anything that i would consider to be creative at all i mean even this flyer this was the first probably the create most creative thing that i'd done up to that point at least so much as i can remember and this the flyers when we did our flyers, they, they, they were so important because they had to convey a certain message. And that message was a professionalism. You couldn't kind of have flyers with like, and most people did at that time, I have to say as well. But you couldn't have flyers that had like acid, you know, get right on one matey or, you know, anything psychedelic, so to speak. You couldn't have that kind of thing on your flyer if you was in a warehouse and you didn't want it to get stopped. I mean, you had to convey a professional outlook, you know, and and that's what we try to do with these flyers without scaring people off and people thinking that's a complete setup. <laughs> but, and so that was the message we was trying to convey and Leaside Road, the, this party was the 24th of December, but our first Genesis first event actually took place. I've got a fly right here. Our first event actually took place on Saturday, the 10th of December. So it was only a couple of weeks before where we had our first ever event, and that was in Allgate East. And as you can see from this flyer, again, we we our our flyers were quite uniform. They they basically said a lot of the same stuff on each of the flyers. And it, that was, it would have, you know, the title of the party, Genesis Chapter 1, starting midnight till 9 a.m. We, we used to start quite late then. And I don't know why we used to start quite late. I guess it was on a Saturday night 
and Saturday night are quite busy. It's after pub opening time, so there are a lot of people out and about. And I guess it was trying trying to cover ourselves in that way. But um, so we'd have the date of the party. Please park sensibly. Thank you. Invite only. No invite. No entry. That's something we had on all our flyers, because again, it conveyed a professional private party in that you had to have an invite and the people that actually went to warehouse parties that went to acid house parties because warehouse parties have been going for years before we started doing parties but people that actually went to acid parties they understood this language and they understood it it didn't mean that they had to actually bring the invite or bring the flyer because essentially the flyer was the invite but if you was looking at it from an outside point of view um law enforcement you know media whomever it conveys a certain message and that is it's a private party and the dj who was tony wilson tony balleric wilson who i have to say he was a reputable dj at the time he was up there with the ranks of oakenfold and all those other dudes he was in their ranks and his whole style was Balearic, hence the name Tony Balearic Wilson. And so he championed Genesis parties in the beginning because our events, they wasn't necessarily all acid house music, such as the likes that DJ Pierre and all of those boys produced. In the beginning, Genesis, we, we it was mostly Balearic music because we, although we hadn't been to a beefer at that point, we were in Tenerife, um, which is a whole different atmosphere. But again, in Tenerife, they had quite a Balearic style of music. And in so Genesis, we kind of acquired that vibe from attending all the events such as Sin, Trip, Spectrum, Land of Oz, um, and a load of other nights around uh, London at the time, Love of the Wag, total confusion there, there were quite a few nights really cool club nights at that time that were championing house music and you know when acid house came into the mix they also championed that but we you know we were playing Balearic and Tony Wilson he was one of the top DJs in terms of Balearic we always had when it came to the DJs, it, I mean, in the early, I mean, our first two flyers, I, I was looking at the flyers earlier on, I noticed that our first two flyers, we had Tony as the headline, plus top guest DJs. And for anyone that's listening, we also had these other strap lines on our flyers that said, we are totally legal, no alcohol on sale, fire officer on site, lasers, smoke, strobes, a 10k sound and stage props we also had the management reserved a right to admission strictly over 18s because again although the press were trying to give the impression that these parties were full of 11 year olds and teenagers we were never ever trying to encourage teenagers to any of our events none of the promoters were and we didn't we didn't have anyone that we thought were under a certain age if you were young and you looked older than what you were that's a different story but if you looked under 18 you wasn't coming into our party and that was it and we didn't need a massive media campaign by the national press you know to say going on about teenagers coming to our events and all this stuff we didn't need that we just didn't want teenagers out of our events because you can see from our flyers and from our message that we were trying to stage professional events and these were the first events we'd ever staged but we were trying to come across as professional as we could because we actually saw this as a potential career you know we in these early days no one you don't think about the end right at the beginning you know, maybe in the middle, but you definitely don't think about the end right at the beginning. And so you think this is what we're going to do now. This is it, you know. And so I'll go on to chapter two, which we were just looking at. So chapter two was at Leaside Road. And again, it's really the same flyer, you know, just 
this event was called The Struggle Continues because we like to give them these little strap lines. You know, Genesis chapter one was just Genesis chapter one. It needs no other strap line. It's the beginning. That's it. So we had this party on Christmas Eve. 1988 but then if memory serves i'm sure we had a party in this warehouse on boxing day as well um because our phone lines were buzzing we got so many people that were hitting us up so many people who wanted to have, have a different christmas who wanted to spend their christmas in a different way and um, not in the traditional sense and so we opened up the warehouse on boxing day and we didn't have a flyer for that and so on Boxing Day, we were open. And again, it was, there was hundreds of people. It wasn't thousands of people. There were, there were hundreds of people there. And you could see uh, at this stage, we were charging um, one invitation that allows two people entry for £5 before 3 a.m., £7 after. So it was very reasonable to get in. And it was a huge, big, big old warehouse as well. And so chapter three, which was Boxing Day, it was just a few days after Boxing Day, <laughs> on the 30th of December, we actually put the warehouse address. It was Leaside Road, Upper Clacton Road. And this time we, we didn't put Tony's name um, as the headline, but we actually just put special top DJs because what DJ? I mean, don't get me wrong. Tony Wilson was an amazing DJ, and I'm not trying to discredit the likes of Carl, o Carl Cox and Oki and Trevor Fung and Loud Noise, and I'm not trying to discredit any DJs at all, you know. Um, but for us in this warehouse, it honestly didn't matter who played the music. It, it didn't matter. As long as you had the right music, it didn't matter if you could mix. Some of those DJs I mentioned were just starting to learn to mix. Um, so it didn't matter about mixing. What mattered is, is the playlist. That mattered more than anything else. And I should also mention that by this time, Tony had actually... Tony from Sunrise had actually come and visit us by this time. And he wanted to join up and with us to do this party as well on the 30th of December. Um, but we said no. And he said, well, what about New Year's Eve? And so we'd already met Tony. So at this point, we already knew that we were going to be having a party on New Year's Eve. <laughs> so here we are on the 30th of December. We'd put the address of the actual warehouse and we had a map on the back of the, the flyer, which we've, I can see it's my handwriting and it's like my hand scribbled directions to the building. Um, because we felt like confident enough that we could actually put the address on the flyer and we wasn't going to get any bother from law enforcement. They hadn't bothered us up to this point. Well, actually, they, they, they'd come once and we'd given them a, a document that we actually got from the person who was leasing the building. Now, I'll speak about that in a bit. In a bit. I don't want to get trapped in these flyers, but all I wanted to do is show you these flyers. And so we did one Boxing Day, so then we did another one on the 30th, and then we did another one on new year's eve with sunrise and we called that genesis sunset and as you can see for people that are watching it's also got it's got the genesis green man logo and in the middle it's got the sunrise logo it was called the final party we had top djs evil eddie richards colin hud phil and ben terry farley and fat tony we had a 20K turbo sound and a really high production in terms of lighting. So we did Leaside Road and this this um, casino card, it was from one of the casinos in London. Um, it was a hard to get hold of 
and no one this was actually a vip card in terms of anyone that came to the door with one of these casino cards it was given to them by tony and i thought i would keep it just for my scrapbook but if you had one of them you could come in for free and then we also did another party in the same venue it was on the 7th of january see we've been we hadn't stopped basically almost like from the 10th of december from our first event we hadn't stopped you know we i think we had one gap like where two weeks where we didn't do an event but after that it was just it was on it really was on and this flyer is top dj lineup Eva lady richards trevor fung phil and ben invite only no invites no entry and it had all the usual stuff we are totally legal fire officer on site 20k turbo sound bouncing castle blah 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 and i think we had yes so what i should say is before this party actually happened we got a visit from the police now let me show you some other photographs now so before we go on, let me familiarize you with Leaside Road with some photography. And this was the entrance entrance to Leaside Road. Here's a picture of the interior of Leaside Road. And round to the left here, there's there's another whole bit as well. We wasn't really that concerned with photography. It's deeply regretted now. I really wish that we took a lot more photographs of this venue. And obviously the cameras wasn't as good as what they are now too. You know, the, the, the resolution is really low on these cameras. This was 1988, you know, so here are just a few pictures and I will come back and talk about each of the pictures. There is a bit of a story that goes with Lee side road and how we got the building in the first place and it is quite a long story but i'll give you a shortest version of it and in all truth i'm not 100 percent sure how keith actually got this warehouse because over the years i've had a couple of people come through to me and say hey you know i got that warehouse for keith and a couple of lads you know and i don't really want to mention their names in case they don't want me to mention their names so Genesis chapter one was staged by myself and my partner, Andrew. And at that time, we, we didn't really think that we would get any more partners or, you know, we wasn't even thinking about partners. Um, but so we'd done chapter one and we'd had a first four doing these types of events and an old friend of mine, because we were all Hackney boys, um, the original Genesis promoters. And one of my oldest friends, Keith, who actually came to the party that night. Well, in fact, he went to rave at the cave. And I'm not sure if he would have actually come to my party at all, had it not been for the fact that rave at the cave was raided that evening. I actually discuss that party with the rave at the cave promoters, DJ LSD and DJ Chalky White. Uh, we, we spoke about that night because on that night they got raided by the police who arrived by a train because Raver the Cave, the warehouse, was right next door to a train station. And so the police all arrived on a train, which I've never heard before and I've never heard of anything like it since. But they arrived and they had a TV documentary uh, team with them. They were an investigative news uh, crew called World in Action. And they recorded everybody getting searched and they arrested the lads. It's a good story. You should tune into that episode, the Rave at the Cave episode. Um, they got raided. And so it was probably around three, four in the morning. Or maybe it was a bit earlier, but it was certainly early in the morning, maybe two o'clock. And they, a lot of people who were at Rave at the Cave came to our party. And we only had a small number of people there. And at the time, there were a couple of heads there. Anton the Pirate, he was already in the building. Big shout to Anton. Sarah HB, big shout to Sarah. 
and our other friend and i can't remember her name i'm really sorry darling because she was a good person um they were already in the building and i don't know how many we had in there maybe a hundred and delsky peanuts tony jack all of the lads they were all there maggie you know my sister shrine amber um and a lot of the people we kind of hung out with around that point they were all there as well i hope i haven't missed out anyone's name there because <laughs> they were like dude why didn't i get a mention um eddie you know so they were all in the warehouse and so when all these lot arrived they brought this massive crowd with them and the warehouse was packed out and so that was genesis chapter one and so keyford you know he was really interested in becoming a part of it you know and i used to hang out with keith and so it kind of made sense but keith needed to bring something strong to the table in order for me to convince andrew that we needed another partner and within about weeks later so meanwhile andrew and i we were out on the streets we were looking for warehouses and, and at this point it was we realized that we might have to, we needed to break into warehouses so we were prepared to break into buildings um and so we were looking around industrial estates and and all different areas where there were empty warehouses because effectively margaret Thatcher had closed down a lot of private industry uh, and privatized a lot of the industry and a lot of you know a lot of dreams were broken in a lot of these warehouses which were repossessed by the government and now stood empty and stood empty for years. And, uh, and I like to think that we, we, we brought a ray of light to a lot of those spaces and we almost cured those spaces and we filled those spaces up with love. But Keith really needed to bring something strong to the table in order for him to join with us. And this building, this Leaside Road, we, Andrew and I actually found it one night. You know, we were driving around and it was winter. So obviously it's December. And so it gets dark quite quickly. But we we came across this building. And although you can't see I'm from the photograph that's currently on screen, which effectively is just a picture of the door, um, of the entry way to get inside the building, it's actually a massively long building. And we we were walking down the road and we saw these flashing lights through the window and we were like what's going on there because there was no cars outside it was completely dead the area and so we wondered what was going on and we went inside the door was open and we went inside and there were about six seven people at the far end of the building around these milk crates and we kind of went in and we said hi lads blah 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 is this your building they were quite defensive uh, and they said, yes, it was their building. And we said, can we hire it off of them for a night? And they were like, no, jog on type thing. And so we left that building feeling quite gutted because we wanted something. It was a fantastic building. And within a few days, Keith came to me, phoned me up. He says, Wayne, if I brought you a legal building that could hold thousands of people, would you make me your partner would you and andrew make me your partner and so i said i don't know i'll have to speak to andrew i said so andrew would you think and he said yeah if he can bring us a building that's legal and so the next day keith brought us to leaside road now there's been a bit of a debate about how he got the warehouse <laughs> i don't know how he got the warehouse and that's the truth um but he brought me to the he brought us to this warehouse and so we were quite shocked because obviously we'd been to this warehouse and he brought us in and he had already spoken to the chap and he brought us in to meet the chap again who said he owned the building and so we had enough money on us for a deposit i think we did that night or i'm getting it confused with another day or the next day but what I remember is that we gave him some money because we, oh no, that was it. What I remember about this exchange with the chap that said he owned this warehouse was that we said to him immediately, can we hire the warehouse off you? And he said, no, 
some other chaps have hired the warehouse. He said, but I'm waiting for a deposit from them. Um, and they're coming in a few days from now. Uh, and if they don't come, you can have the building. So it was dependent on these promoters turning up and paying a deposit. And so we waited a few days and it was a long three days because we were really gagging to have this building. And by now we're probably a week after our first event. So it's like the 17th, something like that, 17th of December. And so the time is pushing on because we definitely wanted to have a party over Christmas. So we waited for that three days. It was a really long three days. And we went back really eager with money in our pocket. And the other chaps hadn't turned up. And, and so we immediately said, you know, how much to rent this building for, to do a party for four nights. And I can't remember how much he said, if I'm honest, and, but it wasn't a massive amount, 500 quid or something like that. And we paid him the money up front and, you know, we had the building. And then he wrote us this handwritten piece of paper on this like notepad and it had his fingerprints on it because the warehouse itself was greasy and it had a few cars in it because this guy was fixing, he was some sort of mechanic and he was fixing cars in the warehouse. And he had at one point, not necessarily at this point, although when we went in there, there was a few cars in there, but mostly there were car tires. They littered the whole warehouse. I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of car tires. And there was loads of greasy oil patches all around the warehouse from leaky oil tanks. And he gave us his letter hand document, had his fingerprints on them and everything, you know, from grease and stuff. Because he, he didn't really care, you know. And, you know, I'm not judging him or anything like that. That's fine. So it was on. Our first task was to actually clean this warehouse up. And as I said, we only had a short time to do this. And so we set about it and it was really, really hard work. I have to say, we were in this building for hours and hours and hours every single day, cleaning it up. And, and I'm showing a picture right now of the warehouse from one angle. And it's after one of our parties. And as you can see, that we've done a good job of getting all the grease away. And you can see that we utilized a lot of the car tires because this particular building had another floor. I think it might have actually had another two floors and they were all equal size to this one. In fact, the one above was even longer than this one because at the far end of this building, it had some doors. And in, in those doors, it had another section of a warehouse this size. And on the floor above, it was just one massive floor that went across both sections of the warehouse. It was huge. Uh, we did have future plans on moving up to these floors. But for now, we needed to get our own, we needed to clear up one floor and let's fill up this floor first. And so we moved a lot of the tires and we moved them to the floor above. And so there was just li literally car tires littering the, the first floor. And, and we got the building ready to go. We, we needed to, if you can see on the right hand side here, there are some backdrops that we had to, that we needed to cover up to stop a lot of the light coming in during the daytime. Because in the morning, you know, seven, eight o'clock, it'd be quite light. We didn't need that light coming through the windows. So we tried to do our best, which as you can see from the photograph, it's not a great job because all we really did is we we nicked a load of backdrops from a a building site that had been a building site forever and so we decided that we we needed these backdrops and so we nicked these backdrops that you can see on the right hand side and we nicked as many as we could and we covered up as much as you could but you could you, you just do as much as you can it was a diy culture and another thing we did we went to an army surplus store and we bought lots of camouflage nets. We bought the winter ones, which were white. And we bought uh, parachutes. 
parachutes came in their in their backpacks you know they were ready to go type thing although i wouldn't risk jumping out of an airplane with one they weren't ready to be jumped out of airplanes but they came already packed fully packed in a backpack and really that was to cover up the ceiling and the lights really looked good above the parachutes or beneath them or whatever so we we would cover the the ceiling with these parachutes and so when you would look up it, it, it made a difference it really made a difference to the interior of the building you could have been anywhere you, we we tried to create these dreamland environments these landscapes and so if you looked up that would kind of be part of that it was a fully immersive environment and the to the parachutes and the, the camouflage nettings and that they all really helped to really achieve that that feeling of and, and the other thing that we did was we covered the floor in sawdust so everything that you can see in this photograph the whole entire area we've cleaned it up for this party but the whole area was covered in sawdust and we did that because as mentioned earlier there were a lot of oil puddles all around the warehouse from vehicles with leaky tanks and so we covered up those leaky spots and we, we looked at it and we thought well you know what let's um there were so many of them to be fair that we felt that let's cover the entire floor and see how that looks and it looked amazing i have to say it it was so immersive that it was you know everywhere you looked it, it was a 360 experience and it was almost cloud like many people would later comment that it felt like they were walking on clouds and we had also in this building we had a, a giant christmas tree which was kind of here for those that are, are watching on video and it was a massive christmas tree that we we stole outside of an official council building and you know they always had big christmas trees and we we, we had the christmas tree there and on that christmas tree we actually had lots of card now the picture i'm showing right now is me a really tired me and I, I'm, I'm in the warehouse and i'm and you can't really tell because it's a black and white photograph but i'm there's a load of uv card on that mount in front of me and it's all different colors and so I'm really about to start cutting it all up and to throw it onto the Christmas tree and to put a UV light above the Christmas tree. And it literally looked like real Christmas lights. The, the, the bits of paper, as you can imagine, you know, um, there's nothing new, really shone up like Christmas lights. And everyone would always be commenting the Christmas tr tree lights are amazing. And I'd be like, well, actually, it's bits of paper. But that's me actually creating them. And we spent hours in this building, literally hours. And we had a couple of things happen to us in this building. One of the times, again, this is within the space of a week of being in this building. I remember this, this, the doors, because we never locked ourselves in. But I remember the doors come crashing open and this big geezer come running in, skinhead geezer face red with anger you know and he had a shotgun and he was like shouting at us you know saying swearing this is my building blah blah all this stuff you nicked our building and that's and all this stuff and it's quite scary but where we had you know we were from hackney type stuff and it wasn't the first time that we'd seen you know a gun uh, but it was still scary that someone was waving about because where we came from, we were always taught that if you were ever going to, if you pull a gun out, you use it. And that was it. You didn't wave it about or whatever, you know. And I remember I, I said, some, said something like, you know, you can't come in here with a gun, mate, unless you're going to use it or something like that. Something stupid and pathetic, you know. And he just came straight over to me and was pointing it in my face, you know, just shouting, saying, this is my building. And then he, Andy or Keith said something and he looked away. And when he looked away, I just grabbed the gun. I moved it 
out of my face and just headbutted him and was just held onto the gun and was, you know, wrestling with him with the gun. And then I think it was Keith or one of one of them, Andy, he picked up this lump of wood that was on the floor and whacked the geezer over the head and he dropped the gun and, you know, Keith picked it up and, you know, all this stuff. and But no one was going to shoot anyone. We just picked it up and just said, like, what are you doing, mate? It's a warehouse ass, for, for God's sake, you know? It's nothing, you don't come in warehouses with shotguns, you know, because cause this was acid house. This was all, you know, loved up and flowers and colors and unity. It wasn't about shooting people. And he kind of agreed. And, and we said to him, look, the, whoever you are, the the landlord was waiting for someone to come and pay up. They didn't pay up. And here's our receipt. Showed him receipt because we kept the piece of paper that he had given us. And it wasn't actually a receipt, but it was a note from him. And it was a note from the landlord saying that he had rented us the warehouse for a private music business party over Christmas period. Yeah. Um, because I know it covered us over the period that we were there. Showed him in, took took the shells, Keith took the shells and gave him his shotgun back. And he, he kind of just went and that was it. And so that was the first, I suppose that was the first real flag, red flag, that we were entering a world that wasn't going to be full of glitter and loved up people although it was 99.9 percent .9 was all loved up but there was that 0 0.1 percent you know that wasn't but who could you know you're not going to change the entire world i'll show you some pictures that we had on the build-up so <laughs> i'll show you this picture is one of the props that we had now this is around the dj Stan and in the end what we did was we built a DJ stand constructed of scaffolding and I can't remember who built that but someone built the scaffolding stand and then we built these plimps from the tires again we had so many we had an excess of tires um and when we went we didn't know where to get props you know that's the truth we didn't know where to get props and we went to one of these um, like joke shops or whatever. And the only thing that they had was this inflatable gorilla, which is the photograph I'm currently showing viewers. And they had this skeleton, which I'm also going to show you. And they had this skeleton. Now, I'm not sure what we was thinking when we bought this skeleton. <laughs> but with, oh, you know, I mean, the gorilla, I don't know what we're thinking, but they were the only props of any nature they had in this store so we bought them we painted the gorilla up with all types of uv paint so he would really illuminate under uv lights so this actual prop and everything else and this large camouflage net it was as I said, around the DJ stand. And so the DJ was kind of behind this and it went from the ceiling to the floor. Uh, it, it was, it was quite high. It was, it was a big unit. <laughs> and as I said, I'm not sure why we even had those, but we had them. And this one, this picture is just me in the actual warehouse sitting on top of a heater. Cause it was such a massive warehouse. It was freezing cold. And if you can imagine with no people in there, it's December, with no people in there, it was raw. It was so cold. And we had these giant gas heaters, industrial heaters, but they wasn't, um, you had to sit on them or be right close to them to be, to get any kind of warmth from them. And this is just a picture of me. And again, this is 1988, December, and I guess when we really think about this period of time, 1988, it's such, it was such really, it was such a idealistic period for, for many of us. 
because we'd lived through other popular cultures you know we'd lived through the soul boy era we we wore the soul boy clothes and i'm talking the, you know way back you know i remember wearing the plastic shoes as the soul boy and those belts and the jeans with the stripe down the sides we really you know we invested into our looks and into the music and then the skinhead i was a skinhead i was a punk i was a rude boy uh, lots of people i knew were as well um i was a casual boy you know i was a sound boy all, all these different types of popular cultures had impact on us all because a lot of the people of, that was born in the 60s as i was they all would have been in experienced all of those different popular cultures and they would have also experienced growing up a sense of and it's much like people listening to this who probably wasn't involved in the acid house scene who would be listening thinking we were under this weight of the swing 60s and how the 60s were so amazing and they were so cool and nothing was ever going to beat the 60s and we were under that blanket and so when 1988 came along so all of the uh, the other popular cultures that happened before that i just named although we had a passion for all of those different genres and the music that they produce nothing really compared to the impact of acid house and you could say that that was accelerated by drug use or mdma but the reality of it is that no it wasn't just because of the drug use because as we've established elsewhere in the podcast you didn't need to be on drugs in either, in order to feel empathy in a certain environment football is a good example of that or a concert is another example of that where people that aren't on drugs in huge groups of people are all experiencing the same emotion at the same time in football it can go from excitement to and love to hate in, in a split second in the kick of a ball and the whole crowd will experience that emotion and they will feel the same thing i've been to football you know so i know what i'm talking about i've experienced it myself and so you can't just attribute it to drugs but the timing of everything the drugs were around um it had that huge huge impact on us all and here we were here where i am particularly as well you know 22 um quite idealistic um thinking that this is something that's going to last forever and you can see from my clothes i'm filthy dirty we were in that warehouse day in day out and even the nights of our parties i would be dressed like this we in the beginning we had the blaggers outfit the blaggers uniform but that was always hand it wasn't something i didn't walk about in a red jacket or in a blazer or anything like that this was how i used to walk around and i guess if people saw us because people didn't know us during that period they would probably think that we were you know the sound boys or, or something you know they wouldn't think that we were the actual promoters and we had so many different things happened in this warehouse i remember when um millie vanilli came down those were in uh, remember the pop uh duo millie vanilli who you know fake their way through the charts but i always say bully to them i always say good you know why not if you can do it the, the music business is full of fakes anyway so if uh they the, what they did was they were completely miming to somebody else's song but it's all about front it's all about bollocks and they had it and they came to the they came to the warehouse they didn't stay that long because they were so popular at the time because and they were dressed how they were dressed on their you know their performances in the videos they were dressed exactly the same so they really stood out and i remember they entered the warehouse and we pulled them aside and we pulled them into a back bit just to keep them away from everybody because lots of people spotted them and you know we met them and we had a, had a chat for about 10 15 minutes and then they kind of had to go because it was a bit too 
it was a bit too overt for them, you know, and, and all what was going on and they had records in the charts. So it was a bit too much for them. And so I guess their PR and their management team said, we better go. And so that was the Millie Vanilli visit. But we had all these parties up until sunrise came. And the photo that I'm showing right now is a backdrop um, that says Genesis. And standing in front of this banner is Andrew. You can't really see them both, but it's Andrew and Andrew. It's Andrew Pritchard and Andrew McPherson. I can't remember who did these banners for us. If you're watching, thank you. And I'm not saying your name because I, I really can't remember who did them. What we also did was what I'm showing a picture now, and it just looks like a load of banners, basically. Um, you know, you can't really see what it is, but it just looks like a load of banners on a wall. But what it actually is, it's a it's a bit of a tunnel around the entrance to Lee Side Road. And so when you walk through that entrance, and so you can see from this photograph, that was the outside door. And so right now I'm just showing the outside door, which is just the entrance to a warehouse for those listening. And we were trying to create this wonderland, this magical landscape, which took you away from the here and now of our everyday lives and placed you into an environment which you could release your inhibition. Um, and that, so that was the entrance. And so you stepped through that entrance and you entered this, and it was part of it was UV lit, but not all of it because we didn't want to, the girls that were taking the money in the door, my sister shrine chick, and we had a couple of other teams that were taking money on that door. We couldn't have them in UV all the time. But what would happen is people would come in, they would pay their money down this end. The door was down this end for those watching. And then they would walk along this tunnel. And originally at this end, we had a sheet that was just loads of strips. So you couldn't really see what was going on. And then you lifted the veil back. And the, the floor was covered in sawdust. So you just entered, it was like, and smoke machines were going off, UV lights, fan lights. And you honestly felt that you were in a different dimension, man. <laughs> and I'm just showing a couple of pictures. If you're watching and you have some photographs of any Genesis parties, please contact me and send me some high res photographs because we didn't have many photographs of Genesis parties, really regrettably. And through this tunnel, once you came through the other side, you know, he had that banner with love and you came through and you entered this wonderland. And in this other wonderland, the other things that we had in this building, because as I said, we, we had a bit of time in this building so we could you know, be a bit creative in there, even though we'd never been creative in this way before. And we built a massive swing in the middle here out of these giant sheets. And so you could actually swing here, you know, back and forth, back and forth. You know, we had the giant Christmas tree. We had the swing. We created like this some seats right in the back of the warehouse down here. So a seat, seat, not a seating area, just places around the edges where people could sit down. What else did we have in there? We had, um, yeah, that was the main thing, really, the big um, swing. That skeleton prop is just here on the left-hand side, and we had the Christmas tree over here and the tunnel to get in. The entrance is over here on the right-hand side. So one night while we are in the warehouse getting it cleaned up in preparation for our first event, which was the 24th of December, Tony uh, from Sunrise and his team arrived. And they kind of knocked on the door, said, hi, you know, I'm Tony from Sunrise. And we'd obviously heard of Sunrise. Sunrise had done the biggest party to date. Sunrise actually got a lot of press over their first party that they did. It was banged out. But I remember there was one of our, a friend of ours, Wheaty, he he was a bit of a hippie kid back then. And I remember he, I'm sure he was on one of the newspapers front page or a page because I think he was standing, he had this like silver foil thing, if I remember rightly. 
and he was kind of waving it in the air and it was reflecting off lasers and all the rest of it and someone took a photo of him that was Wheaty and he was in the newspaper you know so he was quite famous at that point they were actually the top boys at this point I mean hedonism had done a, a massive party before that and there'd been other whereas parties but I think hedonism was the biggest one but then there was sunrise and sunrise were kind of you know they were the top boys at that point as as far as my memory serves but I could be wrong but sunrise were the boys anyway and he turned up and straight away he was can I join up and do a first he was like can I rent the building off you it was like no way and then he was like, can I join up and do a party with you? And so, as I said, we were doing a Christmas Eve and we were quite confident because we were confident that we were in a legal building. We felt that we didn't really need anyone. We felt we had time to grow our crowd and we didn't need a kickstart from anybody else because they would come. We knew that they would come. And Tony was very convincing. It was true that Tony could bring thousands of people with him from the very first night. And he already said, we go 50, 50 and he'll bring his whole crowd. And so we said, we're thinking about new years. And over this period, we thought about new years and he came on Christmas Eve or boxing day. I can't really remember one of them. And there we agreed that we would do new year's Eve because we thought it makes sense if we do that. And it Tony brought in, uh, once we agreed, the flyer for that party was made, which I'll try and find the flyer for you right now. And that flyer was, where are we? This one. So this this flyer was done over Christmas period. So it was kind of done on some, uh, probably the photo machine, photocopier machine at the Sunrise offices, probably in Wardour Street. They, I think they had a, their office was in Wardour Street at the time. And they'd done it on their machines. They did this. Obviously, you can see because Sunset is a bit bigger. And Tony was being a little bit shrewd when he, he called it Sunset because Sunrise, he had a partner in Sunrise. I, don't know, I think it might have been John, if John's listening to this. And... Um, so I think he called it sunset to kind of separate himself from that. And so on this part, on this flyer for people that aren't, for people that are listening, it's the New Year's Eve flyer. It says you are invited by Genesis Sunset to the final party, Leeside Road, Upper Clapton Road, top DJs, Eddie Richards, Colin Hudd, Phil and Ben, Terry Farley, Fat Tony, 20K Turbo Sound, invite only 10 p.m to 10 a.m the management reserved the right to admission strictly over 18s liable to be searched at door which was the usual stuff we had on our flyers and that was the new year's eve flyer and again i wish we had photographs of that event because it was a huge event it was it was so successful it was the biggest event of the night i remember we we had these back rooms where we used to count the money and we had all of the phones because Sunrise brought us the sophistication of having these phone banks with them. And they would sit there, the team would sit there all night on phones directing people to the warehouse party. And this was one of those rooms where we had all of the different phones in them. And Sunrise team, they would be basically counting through, you know, they were directing people to the warehouse and then there we would also be, you know, sworn out the wages and paying everyone that we needed to pay and getting the money out of the building. Here's Henry and his friend, and you know, I'm quite pale there because it's winter, and 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 I was always, I never took things seriously. I was always laughing and joking, really. And for this, the sunrise party, we opened up another section of the warehouse, and it was a section that we hadn't used before. We uh, added a sound system. We had it, its own sound system and decks, and we put some other DJs out there, and we put a couple of parachutes on the ceiling, as you can see from the photograph. And we had a, this small tunnel that was connecting both of the warehouses, you know? 
and this here's just a, a few a couple of photographs crowd photographs that i have I haven't got very many as i said these photographs were sent to me by somebody else but at the beginning of this night we on the new year's eve night the police arrived the police came on christmas eve and we showed them the handwritten note that we had on the note paper and they just looked at it and accepted it. they wrote the details down they accepted it for what it was and off they went and on christmas eve the police car kind of drove around a couple of times and asked us the security if everything was okay and they said yes and that was it and then at this time our security were just friendly you know just a couple of people that we knew it wasn't anything serious it wasn't anything that was going to stop anyone from coming through the door sunrise brought their own security team with them and when the police arrived on new year's eve we had tony and i we went outside and to front them out we had the fake we you know we had the the document that we'd been given by the landlord which was this notepad and tony came out and tony really showed me the ropes in terms of how to front it and he was fronting it as a pop music um promoter and the, the the whole event was totally legal and we had all these contracts for lighting we had professional lighting teams professional sound teams and it was a private music business party and i remember he had a hat on and, and he looked quite showbiz with what he was wearing and he had a blazer on and i was kind of you know his right hand man and then after that night that was when i started bringing my whistle and everything else you know to, so we both go out there in front of them but when i saw what tony could get away with we i i knew then what i could do i i knew what was how far you could push it and this particular night the policeman it was both of us we were on him you know and he the policeman he came we brought him inside we took him we showed him all around the building he could see that you know, it was a professional sound system. It was a professional setup. And he wasn't happy. He didn't want the event to go ahead. So he was trying to find little ways of trying to discourage us. And one of the things in the end, because he couldn't find anything, any reason to stop the party, he actually said, well, I'm going to phone the fire inspector and I'm going to get the fire inspector down. And if he says yes, I'll let it go ahead. And if he says no, I won't. And, and then he he wandered off up the roads type thing and made his calls. He didn't want us to hear what he was saying. And we were waiting for this fire inspector. Now, I remembered that there were loads of, well, hundreds and hundreds of empty cans and bottles and cartons from the parties that were done, you know, the free parties that were done previously. And so we hadn't really cleaned them out. We just threw them all out onto the, the fire escape at back. And we didn't bother to clean them up. So, but I remember that they were out there. And so it's kind of a long story short, because all what I'm saying is all in my book. So I don't really want to go over the whole story. But we end up going out on the fire escape. And we were, we were next door to this open um, spot. I can't really remember what it, what it was. But over, over the wall, was a, a bit of open area a bit of open like marshland or something in between another building and so we just threw all the cans and everything op over the wall and while we were waiting for this in fire inspector to come down and so i got all greasy all the stuff that came out of all the bottles and everything and all the security were helping us as well it was a frantic dash really because we we were expecting that fire inspector to come any second so everyone mucked in and we got rid of it. And the security were all wearing suits and, you know, tuxedo types as they used to wear in the 80s. And I went back outside and within a few minutes, this, this chap came walking down the road and he was looking in all the gutter. He had his head down, looking in all the gutters. And then when he came, it was the fire inspector. And so we all, and he, and the fireman and the policeman walked towards him and Tony and I followed behind the policeman and the policeman said to him, you know, they're having some sort of party. We don't want it. Let's see, let, tell me what you think. And so he said, okay. And he walked into the warehouse and we all followed him and he walked straight out onto the fire escape. 
And luckily, all those cans and everything were gone. And then he came in for another door and he inspected all of the equipment and we'd actually sprayed all of those nets and everything we had in there with fire resistant chemicals because we were in case of this very thing happened we didn't want anyone burning the the net in especially around the dj stand i mean that wasn't even really the fault if anyone was going to burn it the real reason was just to make it fire resistant you never know you know might have an accident and so he the fireman tried to light a few things with his lighter and it didn't light and so that was it and then he came back outside and he said yep yeah, i don't mind you can have your party and so we had the party and so that was an insane night absolutely insane night it was absolutely packed out i'll go back to the flyer but yeah it was in it was an insane night it was absolutely packed out um, as I said, this was such an important night for the, for our generation. It really, because remembering that a lot of the original boys for, you know, your Nicky Holloway's and your Okies and all those dudes, your boys own and, you know, your Farley's, all those lads to them, it was already over the summer of the second summer of love has passed and it was dead. And so here we were we've come into it late but new year's eve this was really cementing our place in history this this wasn't a small group of people really super trendy people that was just and it was just going to fade away this was something that was going to go national and i always felt that it was going to go national and the more people that plugged in the more people that would actually wake up as such, you know, because some people could say, well, what are you talking about? Wake up, you know, people were taking drugs. So again, d depending on your viewpoint on it, MDMA, without a shadow of a doubt, it opened up empathy for a lot of people. It changed a lot of people's lives and it opened us up on an emotional level. And that emotional impact st has stuck with us for over three decades. And so you can't you can't say that that nothing came out of Acid House when an entire generation of people, you know, three decades later are still talking about it. And here I am talking about New Year's Eve, nineteen eighty eight. You know, on the morning after the New Year's Eve party, the Genesis Sunset party, I can't remember exactly what time we finished, but we finished around eight o'clock in the morning or something like that. It was such a huge party and it really cemented Genesis and it put Genesis really in the Premier League of promoters. Sunrise were the biggest at that point and we'd just done a, a collaboration with them and we just achieved the biggest Acid House New Year's Eve party in London. I, I don't know what was happening in Manchester at the time, but it was a big party. Um, and we decided that we would do more parties together, but it was early in the morning. I don't know. It was about 8 a.m. or something. Everyone had left. We sent the security home. And I think there was actually five or six of us in the warehouse, including myself and my two partners, Keith and Andrew. And plus Tony was still there and probably a couple of Tony's people like he's an assistant or something like that, but no, no security, all the security was sent home. And we wasn't even really thinking, you know, we left the warehouse door open and we were in this back room. We well, we were in the back room where we we're counting out all the money and it was a small, tiny, narrow room. And Tony and I were in the room at the time and we could hear, and the, the money was, We'd already moved the money from the building. We never ever kept huge amounts of money in those buildings because we we knew that we clued up enough to know not to do that. But we had probably a few thousand pounds in one pound coins that were stacked up in this room, in this small narrow room. And I remember we heard some voices. Tony and I heard some voices outside of the room, and we could tell by the voices that it was a bit off. Um, and during the course of the night, we had different people that got searched coming into the party on the door who had weapons on them. 
And we had actually took the weapons off them and they were happy that we did. And the weapons were now in this room that we were in because that was the pay room. And I remember when I heard the voice, I picked up this bar that was on, on the side and I, we just stood there and Tony and I was looking at one another and then suddenly the door burst open and this guy just can burst in the room, you know? And so I just automatically, I just whacked him with the bar and I whacked him and, and he was quite a strong dude, you know, and he kind of stopped and he was a bit shocked and he went to come forward again. And so I whacked him again and then his survival kicked in and he just backed out of the room. And then when I came out, I, we, I moved forward into the hallway outside and Keith and Andrew was fighting with some other dudes, you know, and, and when I came running down with the bar, when they saw that we had some weapons, uh, Tony was behind me, bless him. And when they saw we had some weapons, they basically cleared out and they disappeared. And so that should have been another red flag, really. But that showed you how vulnerable we were and that showed you how naive we were when going into this whole thing. We didn't go into it thinking that we needed protection or we needed, you know, security that were prepared to confront gangsters or anything like that. We went into it quite innocently. And so this was quite eye-opening, but at the same time, it was mosquito bite in the grand scheme of things. And all of my confrontations with security and gangsters were all really mosquito bites. I, I, I'm not, you know, diminishing the effect, the impact it had on me as a young lad, you know, it, it had an imp impact on me and I was, I was scared. I wasn't, I personally, Although I had been had lots of fights, my upbringing through Hackney and then down the Roman Road and all this stuff, I wouldn't call myself a fighter. And so it was quite shocking that I thought Ronnie and Reggie was dead type thing. And I thought that all that stuff died with them. And so to suddenly be in a position where people were extort, trying to extort money or trying to rob us, because the extortion came later, but for people that were trying to rob us, it was, it really was eye opening. And we realized that we needed protection from really early, you know, and, and these were the things that led us down that path. And people say, oh, blah, blah, blah. You know, why did you have these types of people at the events? And that's why, you know, we've, within a really short time, we were confronted with shotguns, with groups of people that were trying to rob us. You know, people that were coming to the party, for example, with weapons. And, you know, we take them off them. But, I mean, you know, so this was a small number. You know, so you really kind of had to watch your back. And you had to really learn fast, regardless if you was drinking water, cuddling all your friends and dancing around, telling everybody that you loved them. You had to make sure that the back door was properly locked down before you even thought about giving anyone any hugs. And so that was a great party. And then we decided that we would carry on the momentum. And so we booked our event. So we just told everybody we're going again next Saturday, Saturday the 7th of January. Again, it was Leaside Road. It was going to be chapter six. So it's going to be the sixth party that Genesis had been involved in. The flyer was the new, the, you know, the usual flyer that we've been reading out to everybody. The DJs for the night were Evil Eddie Richards, Trevor Fung, and Phil and Ben. Now, before this event actually happened, obviously the police had, well, the police, had, by this point, I think they were aware that this was going to be a regular occurrence. And we were attracting a real lot of attention in the area through the sheer number of vehicles that were turning up. Even with the locals, we'd had, you know, different confrontations with locals who didn't understand what was going on. And they were trying to, to break into the warehouse through the back. And I remember the one particular day when they were trying to do this, 
uh, we had it was Alfie and um, his brother and his team. And they were a hard team. They came with Sunrise. And his brother, Alfie's brother, had been, I can't remember if he was like a, a bare knuckle fighter or something, a boxer or, or something of that nature. But he could look after himself and he could handle himself. And I remember he was out on that fire escape one night and a load of dudes, you know, 10, 15 dudes all jumped over the fence, all local boys. I since found out who they all were, but they all jumped, all jumped over the fence. And basically, you know, I mean, they, I say attack, but they, you know, they tried to get through the door. And so he had to fend them off physically. And he was basically fighting with everybody and he was knocking geezers out and all this type of stuff. And so we got word of it, you know, the rest of the security came to us. Well, actually, it caused quite a lot of concern because when that was going on, I was in the uh, back room. We changed the rooms now. The rooms that you saw where the telecoms were, we were now in a different room, and it was a room that was located at the far end of a hall, and it was a small, tiny, narrow room. And we were in there. I was in there counting the money with a, a couple of security, whatever. And suddenly, you know, all this, about four or five security came into the money room. And they were saying, look, we think we're, we're about to be attacked. So that was quite alarming. You know, we're sitting in the room and suddenly they all come in the room and they've got weapons, not guns or anything like that, but they've all got weapons saying, we're about to be attacked. And so I said, what's wrong? And they said, well, on the fire escape, there's like about 15 geezers trying to break in and they're fighting with the security out there right, right now. So I was, let me go and have a look. They were like, no, stay in here. We need to protect you and all this stuff. So let's go and have a look. So we went round. And when I went round, the party was still going on. Everyone was having it. They were going mad. No one realized what was going on. As, as I got near to this particular door, fire escape, you could just hear people kicking it down. And then Alfie's brother was, they just brought him inside. And he was like, you know, he, as I said, he'd not been knocking people out. And he said, you know, there's about 50 geezers out there, you know, and they're not messing around. And some of them had knives because they were trying to cut through backdrops. We had some of the windows had backdrops in front of them and they'd smashed a couple of the windows and they were trying to cut through the backdrops. Or maybe they had glass. Maybe they're trying to cut through glass. I don't know. And so we had to call, make a call out for some an added security team to come while this was going on. And then the extra security came and then they all went out there. And meanwhile, none of the ravers knew what was going on and they sorted it out. And then they secured the area. We put some lights out there and then that bother was finished and it was over. So at this point, although we you know, the, the parties were peaceful events, there, there were no, there were no violence, aggression, that was happening at any of these events. We're gearing up to do the Saturday, the 7th of January event. And one day the door knocks and of the warehouse and it's a policeman, a police captain. And he'd come to inform us that he, and he was, he was really nice. He was very respectful. He said, I'm really sorry to bring you the, be the bearer of bad news, but the person that you said rented you the warehouse is actually squatting and he's not paying any rent and he's not on the name for the lease at all. And you need to leave the building within the next few days. And we, we've given you a few days to leave, but you need to leave. And that was it. And so we had to hit the road and we'd already announced. So three or four days before the next party on, on the 7th of January, we didn't have a venue. And we had to print another flyer really rapidly to show people that we, we, the warehouse had changed, you know. But this was another flyer we did. And we used Leaside Road as the meeting point. And so when people arrived at Leaside Road, we, you know, gave them the address of the next warehouse. And so we, we had to hit the road and... 
in that early January, while we were at that warehouse, we created these VIP cards. And this is all with UV pens. We colored them in with UV pens. So if you, you, you held it under a UV light, it would shine up, you know. And that was a VIP card. And we had, while we were doing the Genesis Pass at Lee Side Road, we had like Genesis Sunrise Access All Area type cards. And so that was really our time at Leaside Road. And Leaside Road was hugely important in terms of the growth of Acid House because it was a safe venue. It was always there and it helped us to establish our reputation because from this point onwards, we did a party every Saturday night for almost four months and every Saturday night in a different warehouse. Once we got kicked out of Leaside Road, we did a party every Saturday night in a different warehouse. And so we had to go, don't get me wrong, it was hard work because during those, in the week, we'd have to go out and try and find these warehouses because we didn't have buildings lined up. They were buildings that we had to manually go out and find on the Monday after each party that we did. So it, there was no, it was no easy task finding these venues that were going to be able to handle the amount of people that we were bringing in at that time, because with Sunrise as well, Sunrise stayed in, we were going to be carrying on doing parties with Sunrise. And so we needed, we needed warehouses that could hold that massive crowds because the parties were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And Leaside Road was a hugely important venue for, for me personally, in my personal growth. And Leaside Road actually was the first time that we were able, ever able to allow any of our creativity to, to shine through because it was a DIY culture. It was a huge warehouse. We didn't have huge budgets, so we had to go and steal any props that we could still paint, still Christmas trees. You know, we had, you know, we even stole a couple of those industrial blow heaters. We stole all the fire equipment, you know, the fire extinguishers and what have you. And I remember Tony bought a load. Tony had his own stolen kit too. And he had illuminated fire exit signs and all this kind of stuff. So I remember when the police came, you know, and the fire inspector came on New Year's Eve, we had illuminated fire exit signs, which made a massive difference because the police were used to turning up at warehouses in 1988 and everybody run. No one was willing to stand up and face policemen and confront them and tell them that they were in legal buildings. So everyone would run. And then by the mere fact that the promoter would disappear, the police would then had a license to close you down. And that's what they actually did. They were just, if the promoters wasn't on site. It's closing the party down, but we fronted them out. You know, we fronted them out because we'd had, now we had the formula. Now I'd been, I'd been shown the ropes by Tony from that first new year's Eve event from watching what he said, you know, catching on to, the confidence and the swagger that he had and realizing there were some private land laws that had to be obeyed and there were private party laws that had to be obeyed and because up to this point I felt that police could just go anywhere they wanted to I'm from Hackney and in Hackney they did go anywhere that they wanted to and they did whatever they liked whatever they liked and so I honestly felt this was the case. And so it needed Tony to show me that, no, they can't just come on private land. And once I understood that, it was, you know, from then on, you know, our, every warehouse that we broke into, we were like, no, this is private land. I would move police cars. I would direct police to remove their vehicles off of our land if they even wanted to talk to me. So that was the confidence and the swagger that I got from that first New Year's Eve encounter with Tony. And after that, we fronted 
we fronted a few out together after New Year's Eve. And then Tony kind of got a bit too popular. So he had to kind of sit back. And then I just fronted them out after then. And then that's how it remained. I fronted out all the parties after that. I probably should wrap this Leaside Road podcast up. As I said, it was a hugely important time for us. And I wanted to share some of these memories with you. Share some of the photographs. If you've got any photographs, as I said, please send them to me. Get in contact. Now, before I leave you, I just want to talk a little bit about my Only Love Conquers Hate collection, which is a limited edition set of free prints. Each different print is completely unique. Um, if you, For those that are watching, what you're looking at is a smiley face that has been built of hundreds and hundreds of different words. And each different face, smiley face, is unique. And I didn't want to, when I first set out of creating this art, it, it took me months to actually finalise a lot of the content that I created for these artworks. I didn't just create them in, in the same sense. I mean, I, when I create merchandising, I, I create that. I might create five or six different pod products in a day. But this, I really put my heart and soul into this, into creating what I wanted to be unique artwork. And these are unique. Each print is only 88 prints of each different edition. The first edition in the collection is the frequency of sound. Now, this is made up of a playlist of all of the, the sounds from the period. I'll give you a bit of a closer look. Now, this is a high-res shot, so it's going to take a few seconds to actually render in. But this is a track list. This is, if, you wanted, if you wanted the track list of Acid House, this is certainly it. And if I've moved in a bit closer, and you can see it's made up of all of the different tracks from Balearic Acid House to Hip House. But all of these tracks all came out before... 1990. So, I mean, there's some Balearic tracks in there that were, came out absolutely years ago. But essentially, the time period is between 1987 and 1989. And so the frequency, so the Acid House was launched with this, with this brand new music. And that was the frequency of sound. And in a reaction to the frequency of sound was the rebirth of a nation. And it really was a rebirth of a nation. We, we looked at the world in a different way with a new lens. I'll just go up a little bit closer. Now, the rebirth of a nation print is made up of everything that is associated with my journey into Acid House. And a lot of the time, that's, that's your journey too. So it's not just mine, but... I didn't want to come out of the gate and say, this is everything to do with Acid House. And if it's, if it's not on here, it's not Acid House. I couldn't come out of the gate and say that. So this is my journey into Acid House. And in this image, I've tried to encompass many different attributes of what Acid House meant to me. And so it's all in there from the... the party promoters to the events to some of the songs some of the music to the individual people to all of the different outfits and to all the different things from from the clothes to moments from different different moments to even slangs and different sayings and different locations you know i can see cafe del mar i can see the dungeons you know, I can see Adonis, the Project Club, Grand Parks. There's so much I can see in this rebirth of a nation. And then the reaction to rebirth of a nation was the assassination of youth culture. And that was the press's reaction to Acid House. And this entire image is made up of original newspaper headlines that were published between 1988 and 1990. And there are literally hundreds of headlines. 
And I, I collected these headlines at the, at the time. And obviously some of them, you know, I found later on on the internet. But it's literally every one of these is an, an original newspaper headline. And just to read a couple of them, 8,000 in acid bash invasion. <laughs> I'm an acid house freak. The old acid draconian methods used to control acid parties. Scandal of M25. Cops in dash to rave. There's so many. Jail fret for acid tycoons. Hacienda. I mean, there's so much in here. So this is basically the hall, the the um, only love conquers hate collection. There are only eighty eight prints in each of the collections. It's a silk screen print. It was really high end production. On the reverse of these canvases, it's done in the hacienda factory yellow, and they were designed for float mount. So if you put it in a float mount. The yellow is almost creates a halo around the actual um, print itself, and it just looks stunning. It really looks amazing. This yellow is the Hacienda yellow because it, it, it will look slightly different to what it looks on a digital screen. It's on really thick paper, so it can't roll up. It's 63 centimeters by 63 centimeters, so it's a big old, it's a big old unit, and. It's available now, and if you, you could DM, you could contact my team. It's available now. It's a really reasonable price. This is a piece of art. It's an investable piece of art that which will go up and increase with value with time. And so I suggest that everybody that buys one of these prints, keep it for as long as you can. They are built to last a lifetime. These pieces of art will be around a lot longer after I'm gone. And so they were built to last a lifetime. These wasn't novelty items like the merchandise stuff can be, you know. So have a look, get in contact with me if you're interested in buying any of these prints. And once again, this what this podcast was dedicated to Genesis 88 at Lee Side Road. This is the 88 podcast episode 13 with yours truly, Wayne Anthony, and I'll speak to you next time. Take care and see you later. Do you think it's anything to do with a certain religion? Do you think? No, is it anything like that? No, it's no, more to do no. with a kind of a drug, isn't it? It's a drug. Yeah, well, those that take it want to be all be ashamed well. of themselves. According to the Sun, there were thousands of empty ecstasy wrappers littering the floor of the 250-foot-long hangar. Drugs, sex, sensation. Some newspapers have called Acid House Music a sinister and evil cult which lures young people into drug-taking. The message is certainly getting across. The organizers kept the location secret until the very last moment, which was the main reason, according to the papers, why there were so few police here and they were unable to act. Drug-crazed kids, some as young as 12, boogied for eight hours yesterday at Britain's biggest ever ecstasy bash. The party took place here, infiltrated by reporters from the Mail and the Sun. There's, there's meant to be a drugs related craze. What do you know about acid house music? It must affect the brain in some way. Unless it's just the music that Must've does been. it. Who All knows? them lights flashing don't do you any good either, do it? <laughs> I wouldn't even go in the no. pub where them lights are. Oh, no. They drive no. you mad.